All right, cool. So, gang, I'm going to keep it relatively fundamental today, but delve into some deeper concepts, you know, for those that have been at it for a little while. It is an introduction, so it's a bit of a baseline, and we'll just sort of see how deep we go. That said, I don't know if Jay's joined us yet, but he'll be popping in about midway through, who will be sharing his experience. So, again, I know a few people here today come from tech backgrounds. I actually wanted to step away from that and get more of a business lens on things. So, that's going to be part of the topics for today that we're going to cover. So basically an introduction to OKR. I'll go relatively introductory, but not, not too light on. We'll keep that section moving relatively quickly. We're going to explore how it's enabling a post-COVID recovery. So we're seeing a lot of businesses right now really benefiting from this. And that's part of why I wanted Jay today because he's gone through, well, his company's gone through incredible growth off the back of the, the pandemic sort of uh, rolling forward and I guess he's restrictions easing Australia uh, but he's really using OKR to help him drive that growth next was learn how to start right away so this is particularly focused at leadership teams and executive teams so if you're in a product team you can just sort of get into it make a start and Paula I just saw that you joined us that's awesome Declan I can see you're here as well that's super exciting look at me I shout out to everyone there's lots of awesome people here a few familiar faces and a few new ones too which is amazing so, yeah, and finally, Jay's going to come in and give us a bit of a wrap on, on you know, what, what his experience has been with OKR. We'll turn that into a bit of an open Q&A section where we can all ask questions, whether it's for me or Jay, we'll get into that. Everyone happy for me to get started? Fantastic. All right, so let's get into it. So really a little bit about the why before, behind OKR first. So I really like this statement. You know, it's Seth Godin. I don't know, who, who knows Seth Godin? Give us a bit of a wave if you do. Yeah, a few people... So he's a really, yeah, most people. Okay, cool. So famous marketing guy, probably known as one of the best marketers. Uh, wonderful quote in front of you. You can read for yourselves, but the short version is basically people who set goals tend to do really well. It's a lovely sentiment, lovely statement, but what's the data behind it? And this is where for us as organizations, we've got to start critically thinking about why we're embedding these kind of things and the purpose behind it. So this is really what we're starting to see now. As these sort of messages and ideas come out, people are starting to think about OKR and goal setting in general a lot more. If we start thinking about, okay, what is the data telling us? I came across this really interesting study. So IBM 20, 2021 CEO study I was looking at the data through that and since the pandemic, so they had the numbers from the previous year, since the pandemic, people are really now seeing the need for rapid adaption and change. And I think, you know, the, the pandemic forced that on a lot of people having to go into lockdown, these kind of things, but it's now become a bit of a staple part of doing business. I think we've all seen it coming in business for a long time. Now it's well and truly here. So 56, 56% emphasize the need for aggressively pursue agility and flexibility and operational agility. So that means not just product execution, those kind of things. It also means just how you run your business in general, whether you have a call center or anything like that. Really, really fundamental. Another interesting study was what PwC is sort of, uh, sorry, their, their, their CEO study. And they found something really interesting around the economic growth outlook. So not only do we know we need to be adaptable and nimble, we also see a lot of growth happening over the course of 2021. I think, you know, by now we're actually seeing a lot of that for those in Australia in particular, which I believe pretty much everyone here is today. You would have seen a lot of growth in the job market, in the stock market, uh, property market, all these kind of things are going nuts, which is creating really good conditions for business at the moment. Of course, there's still winners and losers and it's a really challenging time. However, this is something that we're seeing across the board. So we're seeing the need to move faster, the need to adapt better. We're seeing a growing market, which also means expanding market shares. And if you can defend your space or grow your space, you're going to be much more effective than your competition. It's a really, really important time to be focusing on that kind of growth. There's a study that we did last year, which was on OKR and who actually introduced it. So or introduce it into their business. So a lot of the experience we've seen with OKR and also sort of new ways of working, it tends to be brought in at the team level. And this really, really surprised me when we read this survey. I was expecting majority would be people who are, who are team leaders or team members who have introduced OKR. And we found pretty much the exact opposite. So the vast majority, just about half, were executive team members who have introduced OKR into their businesses. Then another third of that, or sorry, another quarter of that, just about, or just over in fact, they are heads of department. So we're talking about quite senior members of the business and therefore really only a, a sort of, you know, just over 25% of the business are applying OKR as it started by 
the lower level team. So team leaders and team members. So it doesn't mean they're not doing it. They just weren't the ones who introduced it. So I was pretty surprised by that. And so this is why we're seeing this is such a big thing as we're coming into a time of economic growth and so much sort of focus that businesses need to create. So that's a little bit about the why behind what we're seeing. OK, I'm going to come back to the benefits of OK in a moment, but let's actually talk about what it is. So lots of companies use it. Probably most of you who have who've given everyone sort of saying they've seen it before. This is not going to be a big surprise. I'm not going to name all the companies. Probably the biggest ones that popularized it were Google, and that was because someone by the name of John Doa was uh, working at Intel at the time. And that's really the birthplace place of OKR relatively recently. It was, uh, sorry, I'm just going to add someone in. I've got to juggle the screens here for a moment. Sorry, gang. Um, relatively recent in the 1960s was when OKR was created. So if you're looking for some new fangdangle sort of setup, you're, uh, you're, you're in the wrong place. So John Doerr worked for Intel. They applied OKR framework there and he eventually, John Doerr became a venture capital, uh, worked for a venture capital firm and early stage conversations with a lot of companies, they started on, well, what sort of goal setting framework are you using? The answer was most often none. And so he said, well, look, try this OKR thing out. And so this is actually why Google is one of the best examples. He was an early investor in Google, uh, back around there in a garage, and basically they started in that space. This is where we see it sort of getting popularized. This is also where we see some of the interesting practices of OKR come out because John talks about it at this now, what is Google today, a very massive company or Alphabet. So some of the lessons that you might see from John Dollar's talks and books and things like that, they can actually be a little bit, in fact, significantly different to what is now considered really good practice and what works well, particularly in smaller businesses. And by smaller, I mean, you know, even the likes of ANZ Australia, Australia and these sort of businesses. Those companies are a little bit smaller than Google, um, all the way down to startups. So we've seen this sort of journey, but there's a lot that are getting a huge amount of value out of it. So... A really simple way that I like to frame up OKR, and this will just help us all get onto the same sort of page and what it's about, is OKR is a way for us to make meaningful progress on our strategy. We're taking small slices at a time to make that progress. So if we look over here, our vision and purpose, in this example, we work with a lot of engineering companies and they tend to love this kind of stuff. Vision and purpose is to set up a civilization on Mars. We know there's a few people working on that right now. So that's the end state, that's the end goal, and it's gonna take us a long time to get there. It's not like we just say, well, that's where we're gonna end up and we just magically end up there. So if we talk about the flight plan there, that is in this case, our strategy. It's a unique path that we're gonna to take to get there. There's been many other shuttles that have gone to Mars every time they take their own unique path. Every time they go on that journey though, they do need to course correct as well. And that's a key part of strategy. Often your vision and purpose are gonna be pretty well fixed. It's where you want to end up. But your vision and strategy, oh, I've just realized my video is off. Let me fix that for you. I don't know why that dropped off, but I'll get that going. There we go. It's going to be a slightly different camera angle now, but anyhow. Uh, so yeah, so that's going to be pretty well fixed. Your vision and purpose is going to be pretty well fixed, but your strategy is going to be pretty well stable, but you'll need to tweak it every now and again. Now, OKR. OKR is our first initial step that we make towards that strategy. And so what do we mean by that? It means that we're creating a state of change. So maybe we're the rocket ship on the Earth's surface and we want to get up into the stratosphere. That's the first initial step and slice out of our strategy. And there's a number of measures that we could use and that so our objective might be getting to that stratosphere. The measures would be the key results. And so they're gonna be things like trajectory, speed, all these kind of measures that are gonna really help us understand how do we get into the right sort of position to then continue our path to Mars? Now, there's another one, and this is where I'm gonna to touch on very quickly about the whole KPI versus OKR thing. Stephen, awesome to see you, mate. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, sorry for being late. Oh, mate, you're, you're, you're fine. We're, we're always expected with the webinar. Just great to have you here. All right. So, yeah, if we think about the KPI side of things, how does that apply here? Well, I like to think of them as health metrics, and so, when the rocket ship's going from a change state, so the Earth's surface up to the stratosphere, we want to know it's making that progress. That's where the OKR is really handy. We also want to make sure the rocket is in a good condition though. And that's where your KPIs are or your health metrics. So as we're going along, is the temperature okay for the for the pilots? You know, Are they in a safe condition? Are they going to get overheated and incinerated inside, right? And all the astronauts, you don't want them going through that. Is it going to be shaking too much? Have we got too much oscillation? Those are the kind of things that as long as the metrics are within a safe range, we're happy. 
That means a really, really good thing and we're in a good state. Now, let's say for example, the rocket is heading off course while it's taking off. Well, okay, now we need to readjust that. So sometimes a health metric can become an OKR because you need to course correct something. Generally that won't happen in cycle, but sometimes it does. But that's the really fundamental idea behind what OKR is, how it differs from OKRs and how it helps you make progress on your strategy. We're gonna go a little bit deeper into that in a moment. So what exactly is an OKR? So again, everyone's got a fairly good idea from this based on the poll earlier. So I won't go too deep on it, but in its simplest form, we're saying we will achieve an objective as measured by key results. And the simple form of that is, or a simple example of that is, we will improve usability as measured by customer satisfaction. Really, really simple, right? Not over, overly complicated. We're talking about an outcome and how we're gonna measure it. Now, in practice, you're actually gonna set targets and, and, and goals behind those key results. So the customer satisfaction, you'll go from a current score to a, a future score. But in simplest form, this is what it is. If we go a little bit deeper now, this is an example of an OKR. Now we can see here, we've got an objective and a set of key results. That is the OKR, but there's other parts that we need to think about that are important. I'll get to those in a moment. From an objective perspective, we're just talking about become the number one accounting provider for small business in San Francisco. So that's a good objective statement because it's small and focused. It is about creating clarity on what are we trying to achieve? So two things we talk about OKR is they're giving us the why, hence they talk about the, pro the purpose and how we're making progress towards that purpose and vision of our organization. So they connect us with the why, but they also give us a small chunk of what's most important right now, giving us that really strong, clear clarity. So <clears throat> if we look at those key results then, they're about the how we measure that success. They're gonna tell us how we know we're making progress towards that goal. So I'm not gonna read all of them here, but this is the first example. Key result one, increase the reorder rate from 45% to 70% for small business in San Fran. So you're seeing here, we're being quite specific in all these instances because the objective has to be achievable within a cycle, which is generally a quarter. So if we just said, be the number one accounting provider for small business, that's not gonna happen. Even I'd argue San Fran's a stretch, but maybe this firm's already doing pretty well and they've just got to progress it a little bit further. So they're just sort of talking about, here's the location. Let's get clear on geography. Let's also get clear on the industry or the customer segment or the cohort, whatever it might be, but narrowing that down nice and small. And the key results reflect that. This key result gives us that from metrics. So everyone's really clear on where do we start and where do we finish. Again, creating clarity and understanding on where do we get these metrics from? Because everyone will be able to know, okay, here's the source and here's where that metric stands today. The other way of doing that is how we capture here the how to measure it. That's always an important part. And probably one of the biggest things we see with teams, not so much the executive level, but teams who are embarking on the OKR journey, they get started and they set all these great OKRs, but they have no way to actually measure it. Or well, the process of measuring is really, really challenging. So sometimes you can start and actually say, well, okay, here's how we're gonna measure it. We don't actually don't have an efficient way to do this, but during this cycle, we're gonna build in that efficiency. There's ways of doing that. But if you set the bar too hard, too high and make it too complicated, people aren't gonna measure it. As an executive team, you've got to make sure too that if you're introducing new reports and measures that you're not putting overhead on other teams. We have to ask the question of how hard it is to get these sort of metrics. And sometimes we need to prioritize building up the metrics capability and even just the general understandings or what I call data literacy in a business so that we can really, really make sure we're driving the right kind of outcomes and not overloading the teams with reporting and those kind of things. I'm just going to admit Jay here. Very excited to have him here. He'll be joining in a moment. Jay, I haven't seen you pop up, but I can see you've joined the room. So welcome, mate. Fantastic to have you here. He's probably still on mute and getting organized. So as the final piece, and one thing that we see go, go wrong with OKR quite often as well is that we get mixed up between the initiatives and the key results. So people will talk about a key result as in, we want to deliver this new project. That might be an enterprise level or key result. The problem with that is, is that that's not talking about the outcome you're trying to achieve. It's not talking about the impact that this piece of work will have. So we want to come back down to, okay, what is the impact of this piece of work? So in this case, you know, maybe they're talking about, we're going to launch a new customer, um, a, a new checkout experience for the customer. So if that's what we're going to be doing, well, okay, how do we measure the success of that? And make sure we're very distinct. So we're pulling out the impact of that, you know, the idea by improving the checkout is we get increased reorder rate. And the initiative, which there can be multiple of for a key result, 
gets popped up over here. And that way we capture both sort of perspectives because people always like that tangible, here's what we're going to do. The part that we can, we're going to achieve can be a little bit intangible and scary for people if they don't know what is the path to get there. So we make that a really important element of creating OKRs. We're gonna whip through with this one again. We've talked about a lot of these themes already, but the four key benefits that we see from OKR, one thing is you're doing something that matters. You can see the value that you're creating for customers. You're getting really great benefit for the customer and is creating a huge amount of value that everyone can enjoy. And that's because we're talking about what is most important. We're talking about here's the needle that we really need to move as a business. And a common question I ask when we're going through these type of workshops is not what is most important, because if I ask you that about your personal life, right? You know, well, you know, family's important, you know, exercise is important, work's important, all these things are important. It's very hard to say then what's most important. What if we go, okay, if there was only one thing to improve over the next, next little while, maybe the next quarter, what would that be? Now, that's something that we can actually make tangible and something that we can focus on. Even think about your personal life. If there's one thing that you want to do better over the next quarter or even the next month, what would that be? You could think about it and go, okay, well, maybe I want to spend more time with my family or I want to have a healthy eating routine. You know, there's all these different things that you can come down to if you think about just one thing to move rather than what is most important. Clarity on the what and the why. So again, by creating OKRs, we can really give some very clear expectation around here's what's most important, here's why it's important. And by making it public, it can align teams around that. So it gives this good focus point for the whole business that we can align towards the one thing. By using metrics and particularly leading metrics, we can see the progress. So the problem with features and products is it's not done until it's done. It's not done until it's out in the market. So how do you actually get that progress along the way and see that you're making that meaningful impact? And this is where leading indicators are really, really powerful. And we'll talk about those a bit more in a minute. So we said we wanted to delve into that one. And finally, focus and an autonomy or what I call directional autonomy. It's something where teams know what is most important. They can align vertically up the tree. They align to a company level OKR. And as an executive team, you'll be setting a goal that applies to the entire business. It's saying this is the focus for the quarter ahead or the year ahead. There's a few ways of playing it, but generally the quarter ahead and the teams will link in and align to that. Now, rather than it being a cascade, it is something where they have the discretion to choose how they plug into it. And you can coach and help them on that journey if it's not quite right. As leaders, that's part of your role is to support the teams to make sure they're focusing on the right things. Give them a goal, give them the, the things to be done and it's a very fast way to disengage them. It's about saying, here's what we're doing as a business. How can you contribute to that? And so this is how we start bringing it down from strategy. Now, as, as executives and leaders, we've got to be very clear on what is our strategy. And I'm not going to go into too much into the mechanics of how do you create a strategy. There's some really good strategies out there which talk about the customer problems you solve, the capabilities you have to do that, and the areas that you're going to play in to benefit those customers, including the sort of steps you're going to take. That's what a sort of good strategy looks like. They come in loads of different forms. The, if you've got a strategy which is, you know, be the best customer experience in the industry or something like that, which is just really, really fluffy, and that's the extent of it, those aren't the kind of strategies we're talking about. They're impossible to execute on. They're just sort of nice, fluffy, big picture ideas. So from a first step, you need a strategy which has clarity and is well-structured that gives you a customer problem to be solved, a clear definition of who that customer is, the capabilities you're building to deliver on that customer need, and any data points that you need along the way as well. These are all important elements of a strategy or a good strategy. So what we've got here is an example of what a strategic OKR might look like. Now, you don't necessarily need to do this. There's some options behind it. Now, this is for a, an, a, a e, I guess a, a green tech sort of company. So for a lot of people, they might be looking at some of this terminology and going, oh, that's not great. And also it's not great as a practice having uh, acronyms in your wording, but this is just a distributed energy retailer. For a lot of situations where we're explaining this with green tech companies, it's okay. So I thought today I would leave this one in, but generally you want to make sure they're very clear and easy to understand and don't have any sort of jargon inside them. But this is taking a three-year view. And what we've done is color-coded each of the key results. And this is what the aim here is to create some stability so that teams know that these key results are contributing to a certain important strategic lever that we have as a business. Now, the ones that we tend to use, which are generic ones and will always change based on the customer's context, we'll have something around revenue, we'll have something around customer satisfaction, we'll have something around usage, and then we'll have something around operational improvement. 
So by usage, we mean how much people are using your product and, and the level of engagement might be to, total number of users and these kind of things. There's a number of different metrics that you will have around that. Customer satisfaction is how happy are they? And Peter, I'll, I'll, get you, I'll, I'll answer your question in a moment. Thanks for putting your hand up. And revenue is obviously growth of the business. By color coding that, it means that each quarter and each year, you can change your OKRs, but people have an anchor point to focus in on. Peter, got a question, mate. <clears throat> yeah, when I, when I look at these um, uh, OKR, what is it? No, the, the KR one and two and four, <clears throat> they, are, they, they are relative to the current state and the current state will change in the future. So I would say they're pretty poor KR uh, because you know when I come in a year after this plan is made, I don't know from where to where we went and where are we. 100% right. As, as we sort of said earlier, the, the, the this one's not too bad, um, but these other ones where it's increasing from a baseline to a certain other baseline, 100%. I would say these, these could do with a little bit of work. I always feel like having a, a broader level OKR at the strategic level and longer term is less less sort of negatively impactful than having it at the short term. But definitely absolutely right. If you were doing this in, in practice, you'd want to make sure that those were all really good quality OKRs along the way. Um, I probably will say that most of these aren't good quality OKRs. They're just sort of reasonable examples, but definitely great point. Having that to and from, so you've got clarity on where it is, where we've gone from and where we're going to is really important. Or at minimum, you know, an end state. So, you know, this is where if you had something like the, the amount of megawatts and things like that that are being created, that could be a good example too. But absolutely right. Really, really good call out. So from this, this sort of multi-year, three-year strategic OKR, and again, you don't necessarily need to do this. This is something that we only do occasionally, but either way, this is the measurable element of the strategy. We can then bring that down to more of a near-term sort of focus. So what a lot of companies might do, particularly at the enterprise and leadership level, this is not something that you do at the team level, would have something around these more annual-based OKRs. So you might say, well, here's what we need to do for the year ahead. And coming up to the end of financial year, this might actually be a really good time for you to do something like this. Just say, this is what we're trying to achieve for the year. Now, if you want some ideas, you might also just scribble down sort of your two and three-year sort of plan. But... We won't be getting too much in the detail of that. It really is about focusing on this next little while. What does success look like for the year ahead? Now, as you can see, there's a linkage in here. And for this one here, it's quite a strong link. You know, we're talking about increasing the, the, the distributed energy retailer base. The same with this one. So quite often, you're going to have a very close one-to-one -one sort of relationship. Other times, it's going to be a bit of a stretch, but there is still that sync between the two. So increased weekly return users from 10 to 10K to 500K is very similar to that one. So in general, these here line up quite nicely. This one is where we can see for the customer satisfaction one, it's a little bit of a, a different key result that we've got just for this cycle ahead, but everyone knows it's still about customer satisfaction. Now, we've thought about the year, what's the next quarter look like? That's where we look down at to this sort of level and go, okay, how do, we, how do we actually drive the key levers that we have strategically right now to make an impact? And for this example here, we can see we've gone from key result one, which is increasing the megawatt hours, which is again, it's basically the power they produce or provide to, well, you know what? Getting one of these retailers on board takes a lot of time and effort. It's gonna take you more than three months. So that's a terrible measure to use. But we know the more leads that we get, the, the higher chance that we've got to actually make that, that base and grow that sort of number. So in this case, they've set a key result for creating a 10,000 marketing qualified leads. So those are leads that come in the door. It can be via very, various different sort of channels, but it's about generating those leads. And same with all these other key results. You can see that there's a loose sort of linkage in there but it's enough to, to create clarity on here's what we need to do. So this one in particular, actually, we go from increasing our customer satisfaction for the year, which is 40% to 80%. What we wanna do for this cycle is increase the time in, in customer platform time, so the touch time that they've got from one hour to three hours per week. Now, the reason why we're saying that is related to customer satisfaction is the more satisfied they are, the more they're going to be on the platform for longer periods of time. So again, the customer, as, as the teams can see, okay, we're not chopping and changing. We're not you know, starting the year with talking about customer satisfaction. We've dropped that now all of a sudden. We've gone to you know, increase the platform time. We can see that there's a linkage here. We think that's how we're going to increase this overall satisfaction. 
And of course you would have a number of initiatives and projects off the back of this that are going to drive that number forward. Cool. So that is how we go from the big picture strategy down to the quarterly OKRs, down to the team level. And we'll come back to the team level in a moment. What I want to touch on is how does this, how do we do alignments inside a business? Now, I lo absolutely love this, this quote. So Laszlo Block, Google's former VP. So having goal, goal, goals improves performance. Spending hours cascading them up and down and aligning across the business does not. So when you overly engineer and structure this kind of process, you're not going to get value. It's not going to drive more performance. And this is part of the challenge of the balanced scorecard, which is a very hierarchical and very heavy process. Hence, it is only done generally annually at best. It's about having something that is lightweight and more approximate, but enables the right sort of focus points. So what do we actually mean by that? Well, as we said here today, this is largely focused on executives and leaders. So as an executive team, you might for the quarter ahead set that OKR. Now, if traditional KPIs, you would then take that to your direct reports. And so in fact, generally it'd be the CEO that would set it. The CEO would then go talk to each of their direct reports and maybe he'd talk to uh, his COO and she would then go, okay, to tell me what you need from me. She would then go and talk to her direct reports and so on and so forth. And this is a very heavy and slow process. So what if we could actually go, you know what, we're gonna make this much more efficient and just go from top to bottom in one sort of hit and the teams can then align to that overarching objective and the leadership team coaches the team on how to make that happen. And that's where we end up with this sort of rapid approximate alignment which sort of occurs from top to bottom and then teams publicly sharing their OKRs so that where alignment is needed, they can align. And sometimes that'll be in a dedicated forum to discuss priorities and align on priorities, or it might be a little bit more organic and it's gonna depend by teams. If we've got technology teams here, and I don't know how many of those, we've got, we've got to know a few te techies here. If you're doing something kind of like, uh, sorry, um, PI planning, so that quarterly sort of planning with your teams, this would be a good time to be having OKRs and talking about, okay, what are the dependencies? Where do you need to collaborate together? One thing that we find with OKR is you want to minimize the dependencies that you've got. So as an extreme example, if you are, if you're a, let's say a product development team and you have a separate testing team who is used, who is used by multiple other teams in that kind of situation, it's very hard for you to share an aligned OKR because they're tied to everyone else's objective and they're also committed to no one's objective. So this is where we want teams that can deliver capability end to end. And of course, that alignment piece, we can have shared key results as well. So it might not just be aligning up on dependencies, but it might actually be going, you know what, let's share this key result because we're working on the same outcome. That's a really powerful way to get that alignment focus with teams. Right, so I'm going down a little bit deeper here, and this is where we talk about the simultaneous alignment. And we can sort of see with the image from before, you've got this very quick red sort of activity here, which is, the OKR is drafted by the executive team and generally that's done with discussion with the teams in advance as well. So as a leader, your responsibility is to talk to your teams about their priorities, their passion, what they think is important so that you can feed that into the goal setting activity. It's not just purely on your perspective. It needs to be drawn in from their opinions as well. And that's how we create a really engaging sort of setup. Now, as we have this sort of alignment really bake in, this is a powerful kind of thing because we can get the teams to the point of being relatively aligned and we can coach them the rest of the way. Now, I drop this person's name about three times a day, I reckon at the moment, and I've got to work out how to pronounce their last name, but I think it's Joko Willink, ex-Navy SEAL, and he's written a book called Leadership Strategy and Tactics. And if anyone watches Joe Rogan's program, he's on that one a lot. But basically what he talks about is, if he created a mission plan that was, let's say, 100% effective, you know, based on the plan, going to be 100% effective. If he then gives it to his, to me, and his, his, his commanders, they'll then go out and execute on it based on what they've sort of read and understood, but they're not going to have their heart in it and they're not going to be fully bought in. So they're never going to execute it as well as what he created it. So it might be at a 60 to 50%, even less effectiveness. On the other hand, if he talked about the outcome and said, right, this is what we need to achieve, you come up with a mission. 
generally they'd come up with a pretty good plan. It'd maybe be, you know, sort of the, the 70%, 80% mark. But because Apsley owned it, they're going to dominate it at that 70 to 80%, possibly even higher mark, just because they own the mission and they're invested in making it successful. So what he would do is let the team come up with their own mission plan and work out, here's how we're going to do it. But he would coach them if the plan wasn't that effective. You know, if it's at the sort of 90% mark, that's fine. But if they're sort of sitting anything below that, okay, how do we get them to lift up that plan? That's really important as a leadership team. And this is why we talk about this simultaneous alignment activity. It's fast and efficient. It creates team autonomy and empowerment, but it does require a little bit of team maturity because they need to know, okay, how do we contribute to this overarching goal? How can we support that? And again, as a leader, that's your responsibility to help them with that. The alternative, which is, and we recommend this one, of course, the alternative, and this is one I do not recommend because the process, and this comes back to Laszlo Block's example, it's a very slow process and it can be burdensome and it can be disengaging and disempowering. So this is where we talk about aligning OKRs in the previous one. This one is about cascading OKRs. And this is literally where the executive team, maybe it's not going to be the individuals, so the CEO, she's not going to say, right, here's the goals for the company. Go talk to each individual team at that point. It's still team-based. However, the executive team will say, right, for the ops perspective, this is what you need to do to contribute. And for each of the teams under that, here's what you need to do. And so effectively, they're given a pretty clear focus on here's the OKR for you. What you're doing is you're missing out on that team engagement and buy-in. So it can suit low maturity environments where people just aren't engaged on their goal-setting activities. But that probably means you've got a deeper sort of issue, right? This isn't a way to solve that problem. This means you've got some capability uplift and, and coaching and support that you need to do as a leader. The risk of this sort of approach is, as we said, it's slow and inefficient because there's lots of back and forth, lots of coordination. It's the, the extensive alignment work really kicks in because you're going through a very mechanic or me- mechanical sort of process to set your OKRs. Now to align that, it's a really challenging conversation to get all the pieces moving together, right? Because everyone is trying to pull in different directions, different leaders are trying to enforce different rules. You're not empowering the teams to have those conversations. And so at that point, you're also reducing autonomy. So if this didn't convince you enough, don't do it. It's a bad idea. If you hear about cascading OKRs, it's not the right idea. And even if people talk about it and they're really meaning alignment, Don't do the cascade thing because cascade is what you do with KPIs and things like that. And that's why they're only done once a year at best. All right. So we've talked a lot about OKRs and actually no, I can see a few people here who have been on the training. So I reckon you guys will blitz this. So, but for everyone, this is a bit of a quiz that we want to do. It's about challenging your understanding of the OKR framework. So we've talked a lot today. What I want to do is pulse check what do you think is a okay an objective, a key result, or an initiative based on a number of examples that I'll give you? The reason we do this, number one, is it really gets you thinking about what are the different types of activities or what are the different types of items. Number two is as you're implementing this or supporting your teams with OKR, or let's just say you've got a team that's decided to do OKR and you're coming along to this to work out what the hell are they doing you will be able to now coach them and support them on these sort of conversations. So it's really key to understand the fundamentals. So just remembering with OKR, just a key few things to call out. So your objective is the what, you what you want to achieve. It's an aspirational statement. It's something that's really engaging and supportive. But by aspirational, I don't mean it's not unattainable. It's got to be achievable within this cycle. And you've got to be able to say objectively, yeah, I think we did this. I think we achieved this. Your key results are the how. They're your measures on how you're going to get there. They're generally a metric of from and to. You're going from a current result and you're going to a future result. They're going to be often leading indicators as well, but that's for really good OKRs if people are doing that well. Then you've got your initiatives and those are the things that you're going to do to deliver on your OKR. So having that distinction is really important. What I want to remind you as well for one last time is the OKR, in fact, no, we'll come back to that in a moment. We're going to talk about scoring and how we do that, but that's not so relevant right now. So we'll, we'll, we'll delve into the quiz and see how we go. Is everyone ready with the Slido in hand or on the computer? Yep, rock and roll, let's do this. Right, so while you're all getting set up, probably should have done this a moment ago, so you can put your names in there. We will do a bit of a, bit of a poll and a bit of a extra piece on here. Um, Let's, let's see how we go. This is a bit of a competition. If you, if, you don't, if you don't feel like it, I'm not sure if Slido, if you can, yeah, just put in a, 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 a random letter if you don't want to do a full reveal of who you are. Let's get a few more in. Let's 
Excellent. All right. Come on, gang. We got, we got quite a few people here. Sorry, we should be able to get some more in. We're going to start, but you should be able to join midway through. So let's get on here because this is really the key part. I said this is going to be an interactive webinar, so let's make it happen. All right. So make our store the trendiest in Chadston Shopping Center. Is this an objective, a key result, or an initiative? What do we reckon? All right, waiting for the last few results to come in. All right, I'm gonna pop ahead with this one. The next few, we're gonna move a little bit quicker. This one, I'll let, we'll do this bit of a warm up round. Smashed it, there you go, love it. So first round in, really good. This is the objective. So that's something that is effectively aspirational, but still achievable. Uh, could you do it in a quarter? Probably, you know, you'd have to work out what your measures be, but there'd be a way to get to that point within a quarter. So that's really, really exciting. I love it that you guys have nailed that one. So how about this one? And by the way, these are not intended to be good examples of OKRs. In fact, there are some shocking examples in here. The reason we did that again is to be able to think, how do you apply this with your team? So if your team's doing this kind of stuff, how do you coach and support them around this? Let's get those votes in. Here we go. All right, let's give this a go. Gang, we've got more people on this call. I reckon we can, I can smash it out with more votes. Here we go. Spend 15 grand to refit the interior of a shop. Yes, it is an initiative. Why is it an initiative? Okay, it's something that we can do. That's what the key thing to think about with initiatives is. You can go away, make it happen. You don't have to you know, try and achieve it. It's something that you can literally go and do and you can go and spend 15 grand. That's not too hard, especially in Australia nowadays. I don't know what you get for that, maybe a couple of desks or something. Um, you know, if, if it was a key result, it might be about the impact of the refit. So what would the refit give us? Would it give us a, uh, maybe a, a bit, you know, this one, this sort of stuff's a bit weird to sort of survey and probably not my domain of experience, but maybe be the customer experience of being in the store, or maybe it's the mood that they walk away with. Lots of different ways of sort of measuring that. That's what would be a key result. And the objective is probably still the one we spoke about before, probably being something like the trendiest store. Um, I'm going to skip this one because we sort of did one a little bit like that already. Let's get into this one. Double cross-selling between lines of business. And again, these are not intended to be good examples. I love this one. Always makes people go, hmm. I can promise you, if, you're, if you've got your teams doing this, they are going to create OKRs like this, so be warned. I think you need a hyphen. <laughs> double cross selling or double cross selling. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Good one. Yeah. Again, so it, was, it was poorly written. <laughs> All right. Let's see how we've gone with that one. Oh, everyone's low with the shop. All right. Yeah. So the majority has it. Really nicely done, gang. So the key, it is a key result because effectively you, you're saying, you know, maybe it's going from, uh, cross-selling 10 opportunities across the business to 20 now. You know, it's, it's, that's effectively doubling it, right? It's a terrible key result though. So be watching out for those kind of things. Um, you know, if it was an initiative, it'd be something around like, you know, cross-selling drive or something like that, whatever, you know, probably not a great name for it, but that'd be the initiative. Uh, if it was at the objective level, it's going to be about, you know, radically grow our customer base through cross-selling or something like that. So that's that's the sort of lenses that we'd sort of have on this one. So really good. Be ready to talk to your teams about these kind of things because that sort of stuff is going to come up. All right, decrease the number of coffees needed to get a free one from six to five. I don't even know if this is much of a thing anymore. It seems to be on the decline, but the old coffee card stamp. I used to collect those things like stamps. I used to love it. it just doesn't happen anymore. Dare say COVID doesn't help with that. All right, here we go. Let's check it out. So decreased number of coffees need to get free from six to five. It is in fact an initiative. And why is it an initiative? So the reason is we can actually drive the numbers forward in a certain direction just by doing it, right? We can just go, well, change the, tem change the template. We're now doing six to five. The key result for this, now we might have a key result, which is increase the number of coffees sold a day or something like that. 
Cool. And I've just seen some of the comments in here. So can you though, Michael, jump in, mate, because I'm keen to, can't, good, good one to have a chat on. Yeah, I, I misread the question, question, whether I can get oh. away with having five coffees instead of six coffees a day. So. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Yeah, that's 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 my world. That's yeah, I can, I can hear. You. Um, that might be a target for me. Although I'm not quite at six, but yeah, I do I do enjoy my coffee. Um, okay, so yeah, so so we I think we kind of get the intent of that one. The key result, if if it was something, you know, it would be about that increasing sales, all those kind of things. Maybe even customer satisfaction. Maybe customers would be happier if they're getting more free coffees. A few different ways of playing it. Uh, increased marketing spread from 2,000 to 3,000. I reckon we've got probably a good feel for this now, but let's give this a go. Just while people are feeling that, I've noticed a comment from Peter saying the screen seems cut off. Is that is that cut off for anyone else or is it okay? No. Fine for me. Cool. Yeah, I'm using an ultra wide screen and I never know what sort of funky things are going on there. Uh, yeah, so this is another initiative. So if, you, if you're pumping your advertising through Google, believe me, it's very easy to do this. You can go from 2,000 to 3,000, no worries. Um, that's not something you have to strive to achieve. You just load up Google AdWords and away you go. The impact of the marketing, maybe if that was the number of leads, you know, so, so you, can, you can drive up the, the budget for the, for the marketing and, and you'll, get, you'll hit that mark, no worries. But if you actually want to achieve an outcome, which is maybe qualified leads or something like that, that would be a good target for something like this. The initiative might be, you know, spend an extra thousand dollars this month on marketing, something like that. Not too, not too fantastic initiative, but one nonetheless. Well, unless, unless you're a, you're a marketing agency and then you you want your clients to go from two thousand to three thousand, then it's actually a key result. I would, definitely, I would say so. And back to that point of being a good or good or a bad example, you're absolutely right. If you're a marketing agency, you could use something like that. A better OKR in that situation would obviously be something around, you know, more customer leads or something that would fit within that sort of cycle as well. But yeah, back to that rule. So it's a very good one because no one's actually called that out before in any of these sort of discussions. So Michael, Nish, and yes, fantastic. You guys came equally first. Well done. I don't know what you win. You'll have to win something. I'll shoot you something afterwards. Coffee. Work it out. <laughs> coffee, absolutely. Free coffee cards. <laughs> Nicely worked on. And yeah, absolutely. I loved it. This one was the hardest question. Double cross selling between lines of business. That's always a tricky one. All right. So we're going to go smash this through this last little bit now. We're about to get Jay to jump on and have a bit of a conversation with him. Doing a quick time check. We're doing okay. So how does this drive growth? So we've spoken a lot about this at the high level so far. Back to our survey earlier in the year, we talked about, well, sorry, the survey that we did uh, mid last year, I should say, we came up with a few areas and this survey was basically to companies who were actively using OKR and how were they finding the benefits? And the top few things was greater clarity on key priorities, improved visibility of goal progress, and also visibility and alignment for individuals and teams. So if we think about these being the key sort of areas of benefit, that's how this becomes an engine for growth for businesses. It helps people focus on the right things and drive the right sort of outcomes. Now, what we're really doing here is thinking about the why behind our work. So we'll set our measures and the way the cycle will generally work is you'll set your measures at the start of the quarter. You'll see how you're progressing. At the end of the quarter, you'll score yourself to see how you went. Now, along the way, you should be doing a check-in, which we'll come to in a moment, but you're going to see that kind of progress. Now, by coming back and revisiting how did we go on our key results and why did we not achieve them? That question of why is a really key part to this. And Nisha, I mentioned this when you first came on. This is where we talk about double loop learning. So give us a um, bit of a wave if you've heard of double loop learning before. Yeah, a few people. Yep, cool. So this is a really fundamental kind of thing. Most of us think in this sort of, this, this cycle, well, I pulled from an old slide deck anyway. Good thing I'm here to explain it. Uh, so they work through this sort of cycle here where they're stuck between the sort of strategies and tactics and outcomes. So, you know, did we, are we growing market share? No, release more features. Is that getting more market share? No, okay, more features. And you get into these kind of endless loops where you're not actually really challenging the system. This is sort of how thermostats work too, right? They kind of go, well, all right, we're too hot, turn the heater on. We're too cold, turn the heater off. 
we're not actually going, is this the right thing to do? And we often get caught in this kind of loop for business where we're not really challenging and going back to the root cause of things. Now, by clearly setting and measuring our outcomes and the why behind what we're trying to achieve, we engage this double loop learning. And that's where we're challenging the underlying assumptions and adjusting our strategies as we go. So from an OKR perspective, as a business and as teams, what you're going to have is these key results, which if done right, will measure and indicate progress. So again, customer satisfaction is a really good example of that. We can see how we're making progress over time. Now, if I can drive that number forward with some feature enhancements, great. If not, it's not a case of going, okay, we'll keep adding new features to the checkout. It's about going, okay, why are our customers not satisfied with this flow? Why is it not working for them? What can we do to make it better? And we can go and do some inquiry and go, okay, is it actually a, a flow-based thing? Is it actually the technical thing? Is maybe our customer, you know, maybe they're not comfortable with technology. You know, we work with apparel companies where the people who order their products literally order on a piece of paper. Anytime you throw a technical tool in front of them, you're going to get them disengaged. So it's coming back to going, okay, rather than just giving them a, a technical tool or something like that, is there another way of solving this problem? And this double loop learning is where OKR comes in because we're really challenging why are we doing these things? So why do we do what we do? And that is really the key enabler for successful outcomes in business and growth. It gets you thinking about the outcome and it gets you driving towards the why behind it and adapting the plan as you go. Right. Last little bit before we get into talking with Jay and I just want to talk about how do you get started? So this is something where as an organization, you might be just kicking off on the journey. I really want to set you up for success with some great ideas on how to get the ball rolling. These are a number of tips that we've picked up along the way. I'm going to give you the, the top sort of three that we have here. And then this is probably my other favorite, but we're going to come back to that in a moment. So number one, when you're starting out with OKR, don't do it for a year, don't do it for a quarter, do it for six weeks. If you're an executive team, don't force it on your team, do it yourselves and say, right, let's get started just as an executive team and let's do it for a short six-week cycle and see how it goes, see how we find it. If it's valuable, great, expect you're going to have some failures along the way, take those learnings, bank them and then actually improve the process for next time. Maybe the next six-week cycle will then involve the teams below you. If you're getting help with this, you can sometimes involve some other teams, but you'd want to make sure that you've got someone who is really deeply experienced in, in sort of change management and organizational ways of working. So, you know, self-plug there, hey? Um, but like people like Nish, you know, I know you're a great example, Stephen Dowling, like there's a lot of people here that are specialists in that. If you've got the help to do it, you can probably do it with a six-week cycle with executive team and a six-week cycle with teams below that. But if it's just you doing it, I would say start off with, limiting the area, do it in the executive team only. Start off with one OKR. If you've read some of John Doerr's books and other books, they're going to talk about four, three to five key objectives, each with three to five key results, right? So that can be up to 25 key results to focus on at the business level alone. Then you've got the team setting their goals. It's way too much. It's confusing. It's totally disengaging. Keep it down to one. And if you really think about what's the most important thing we need to achieve for the cycle ahead, so in fact, reframe that, you know, if nothing were to change except for one thing, what would that be? And then we go, okay, how do we measure the success of that? That will give you your OKR for the next cycle ahead. Have a champion, have someone who can sponsor it internally and really make it successful. If you're here and you're passionate about it, that person is probably going to be you in the beginning. Uh, we do have a bit more of a, a deeper sort of change management approach. And another shout out at this point, we do have free online learning where you can go and discover a little bit more about this and see some of these different roles. So I'll be sending out some of this material afterwards so you can go on your own learning journey here. But you want to have someone who's really championing and supporting OKRs inside your business. Now to make it stick is this weekly check-in. But we're going to come back to that in a moment. So as we've said, your, your mission and purpose, you've got your strategy and you throw your vision in over here as well. You've got your strategy. This is how you're making progress. Um, Alien, why six weeks? So just jumping back on that question that we've seen here. So the reason why we do it for six weeks only is it's a smaller period where you can have more learnings and less of a blast radius if things do go wrong. So if you, if you set your OKR for the first time and it's on the wrong thing, then you can always go, well, you know what, throw it up in the air, let's change it. Versus if you've committed to an, a, six, a, a, a quarterly OKR and you realize halfway through, well, actually we've done this wrong or it's not working, you kind of committed at that point. It's hard to change and adapt the process. Um, drop another comment if that doesn't make sense. 
All right, so this is what the quarterly cycle looks like. And so this is the how you might do it once you're up and running. Perfect, glad to hear that works. All right, so we start off by surveying and discussing with our teams, understanding what are the priorities around the business. We draft our OKR for the company. We share and iterate that company OKR so that everyone's across and can see what's going on. We then get the teams to set their OKRs and they're going to go through an alignment activity. And at that point, you're off and in execution mode. Now, you might do a mid-quarter check-in, but what you definitely want to do is this weekly OKR check-in, particularly if you're an executive team or a leadership team. This is an absolute must. Now, what that actually looks like, we'll get to in a moment, as I mentioned a few times, but this is really the game changer. This is what bakes it into your operating rhythm. The mid-quarter checkpoint is where you actually go and press chest. How are we going against this? Have we driven the outcomes we expected? But it really is about getting that kind of focus. So the weekly impact meeting. I'm going to share this afterwards. It's a pretty simple weekly meeting agenda. If you have a weekly operational meeting, this is the sort of thing that it can look like. We call it the weekly impact meeting. There's uh, the entrepreneurial operating system. They call it the, uh, what is it? I actually don't recall what it's called. There's another, there's another format, pretty similar type standards, but there's all these different types of meetings which are about uh, keeping a regular weekly cadence on it. What we talk about is doing is in this meeting, talk about and review your metrics. So look at your OKR and look at your other key indicators and things that you need to be thinking about. Sorry, up there with your health metrics. But don't go into problem solving. It's about going, how are all the numbers looking in the business? And are we confident? So your OKR, you want to be doing a confidence score on that. And then you have some time down here in Prioritize, Discuss, Act, which is break apart the topic. If you realize the key result no one's confident in, okay, how do we up that confidence? How do we actually make sure we're focusing on the right kind of things? That is how you get it baked into your operating rhythm. And we keep a pretty simple confidence score here. So every week if we're saying, you know, we look like we've got a high chance of achieving this, give it a one if you think that you're absolutely going to nail this key result. 0.7 if you feel like it's likely we're going to achieve this key result. Um, but you know, you're going to get pretty close to it. 0.4 if you feel like you're off track and you may need some help or zero if you're feeling like you're really off track. By checking on this on a regular basis, you're going to get really good focus and really, really good impact as a team. Now, when we talk about OKR, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, the average that we want to see is about 70% success. Now, the reason is this is part of that feedback loop, that double loop learning that we're talking about. You want to push yourself, see how far you can go. Some of your OKRs, you're going to exceed. So we don't want to go you know, beyond a one, otherwise you're going to get into all sorts of weird scales where you can go above one. You know, there might be things where you start going to negative. Don't overcomplicate it. One is you've achieved it. And what you'll find is on average, some things you'll surpass, so you might hit a one or you'll just meet it, so you'll hit a one. Others, you'll get a 0.4 at the end of the quarter. You're not actually going to be successful. But this is the same kind of scale that you'll use come the end of the quarter to score and rate how you performed on your OKR as a business, but also at the team level. We'd be expecting teams to do the same kind of thing. But anyhow, the weekly check-in, absolutely massively impactful. If you can use a way where it gets to average everyone's views out, so maybe you have, there's a few tools out there. A tool we like is Cohen, but again, you know, you can overcomplicate things by going straight to tools. So my suggestion would be try and set it up where everyone can feed in what they think their confidence is, even using a tool like Slido that we're using today, and then discuss as a team. As soon as someone puts in a score that everyone will anchor off it. So if we say, if someone says, yeah, I'm really confident about this, I'm going to give it a 0.7 or a 1, then everyone else will just follow the leader. So you want to try and get that rich conversation as a leadership team on how do we rate the performance on that. So based on the discussion so far today, I'm curious to see, have we shifted people into thinking about embedding OKR or trying OKR out in their teams? And so for some of you, you might say, have an OKR, you're in bio OKR system. I see OKR, it's a framework, but it's also a system for execution. So I talk about it as a system sometimes as well. It depends how you sort of apply it. So a lot of people are already using it. I think we're all starting right now. Okay, cool. So there's quite a few people that are using it. There's a few people that are going to go have the conversation. There's a few that are saying we're going to do it right now. I love it. You probably do want to go have the conversation, you know, and, and start getting into it. But um, either way, I can see there's some good passion there. So that's awesome. I would say one, maybe there's another question on that, because although some of my customers are using OKRs, I would suggest that they're not doing it efficiently. And yeah. the the big thing I see immediately is the cascading OKRs and um, that hierarchical approach. So, yeah. um, you know, do you think we'll try it? They're already doing it, but they're not necessarily doing it right. And yeah. 
sorry, I, I, there is a question in that, which is, I'm curious how you start to try and um, correct, you know, that when you see the OKRs not perhaps being used properly. Yeah, look, and, and yeah, the sort of how OKRs are not used properly is almost like infinite, right? You know, you got lots of different examples of it. Um, what I would say is trying to take it a little bit slowly with them and, and just sort of helping them understand what are some of the bigger problems that they've got, make it visible, help them see what that problem is and try and improve it in small sort of experiments. So if they're really trying to cascade and cascade hard, what you might find is, let's say it's a product-based organization because these are easy ones. There might be a product team that is a bit of a the golden child of the executive team, let's say. What we might say is, look, you know, they're really bunch of people. The, the team members are really great. Let's give them a go at just aligning without a cascade and just see what happens. And you usually find is through some of these sort of experiments, you'll be able to engage and get them on that sort of journey. The other way is a really sort of rapid refresh of it and sort of what we call a revitalization. And that's almost like down tools do, um, for a lot of you are familiar with a retrospective format, but it's basically like a, uh, you know, looking back and lessons learned type activity on, on OKR and going, okay, how do we want to tweak it and change it? And almost resetting the system. Again, it's it's got to tie back into the needs and wants of that leadership team though to make sure that they're bought in on making those kind of changes. Yeah, really good question. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to skip over this one because I want to get into Jay pretty quickly, but um, for the... Oh, Fred, my heart goes out to you, mate. <laughs> um, look, there's plenty that do. And so I'll never say that there's certain rules where things are a never, like you can't do cascade. Intel, for example, they do cascade and they do it quite well. Um, oh, Declan. All right. We'll, we'll have, we'll have a, a debrief session after this. Don't worry about it. Um, so, you know, I, I will never say that these things are a blanket rule. One thing I'd say though is Intel, they're very mature at this. And again, it's, it was, you know, they've been doing it since the 60s. So it's so deeply ingrained in their culture. And I've actually got a, a blog that we wrote where we interviewed an ex-Intel employee. Um, you've really got to have the right culture for that kind of thing. In most cultures, it just doesn't work. And I've never seen an environment to where it does work well. So aside from Intel. Uh, we've got Stephen who's joined us. A little bit of a late comment. Stephen, you've just joined us a little bit late, mate, but that is fantastic because you're about to get where we're going to be talking to Jay in a moment, who's the executive uh, of ABM Engineering or the CEO of ABM Engineering. Anyway, um, I've been on this slide for too long. It looks like I'm trying to pitch this. I'm not. Very quick one, though. We're going to do a special. So for the next 48 hours, we're doing half price on our online learning platform. So um, use the coupon okr for execs I'll share that after this session as well so you can jump on it. So yeah, have a look at it. Um, it's basically intended to go everything from you've not got any clue about OKR to implementing and rolling out OKR. So it's the you know some of the better OKR practices. We're talking about good quality change management, how to facilitate, and loaded with templates and marketing uh, email communications and all those kind of things to navigate the change journey. So check that out. Uh, I'll share the details afterwards for you to have a look at that. So. Fantastic. We've got a Q&A here. What I will encourage is use this Q&A for questions that you've got. Um, Jay, are you with us at the moment? Yes, I am. Fantastic. All right. What I might do, I'm just wondering if I exit out, if I stop sharing, but everyone keep popping up your questions. I'm going to go through the questions as we go along. You should see in Slider, you'll have a Q&A section. You'll also be able to vote on questions. So you'll be able to jump into that and, and sort of, you know, ask anything that you like. But I'm going to stop screen sharing so that we can actually get a bit of a more group-based view, which would be really nice. So stop share. Here we go. I don't know if that's better for everyone. But Jay, thank you so much for joining us, mate. How's your day going? You're not too bad yourself. Oh, just magically. Good. Awesome having this group here. This is a really big, big, fun group of people. So it's really exciting to, to see them here. Um, but yeah, so uh, mate, just want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about um, who you are, what you do, all those kind of things. Yeah, so we're um, yes, I'm CEO of um, ABM. So we're um, been established for um, four and a half years. We're part of a, a bigger company um before that and then um yeah i sold out of there and um we just started up abm so um we're 100 um sort of family owned now um yeah so we're a, we started off as a, a calibration company so we calibrate a whole heap of um equipment in its inspection testing sectors for um people like um oil search um uh 
so mainly oil, gas, mining, uh, manufacturing. Um, but yes, through um, we always wanted to grow the business into other areas, leveraging off the the contacts that we have within um, uh, well, the contacts we have within the um, industries that we um, service. So yes, yeah, so that's where the OKRs come really handy, um, and we've really grabbed onto it. So we wanted to expand our capabilities not only for calibration but certain other tests like high voltage testing for energy, um, solar. Um, they also wanted to expand into the products area, so offer products um, to complement our services. And we also wanted to, um, we're expanding into IoT, which is um, taking a signal from a, a sensor that could be in a fridge or a freezer or, in a, or on a truck and sending that signal back to a um, central computer cloud service where you can then measure the temperatures or pressures or whatever remotely. So that really helps in preventive maintenance. So where we're trying to do is trying to put all the pieces together. So we're slowly got a key objective every um, um, two months and then we work on that key objective and then we've got a certain amount of key results but all driving the growth of the business so at the start it was um, localities to trying to get as many offices open as we can um, and now we're starting to go more into the trying to increase the, the service efficiencies also one of them is to try to get myself out of the business I'll have less contact on jobs so that um, I can spend more time on important things so so yeah, so that's where the whole OKR um, came in. Um, and we've grown um, significantly over the past six months with um, a lot more headcount. So yeah, trying to align the team has been very important. Um, and I think um, we had uh, some team members last year that really um, we had on the OKR system. Um, and um, yeah, got found out a little bit in terms of they weren't contributing to what they were responsible for as team leaders of certain key results. And it was actually quite good to actually expose them in some respect in terms of they weren't moving the needle or doing what they were sh should have been doing in terms of the key results. So that was actually uh, a good way. And everyone now that we've got on board, um, so the leads are actually yeah, contributing to that and, and, and look at that literally daily and making sure that they're working on their their key results so yeah that's a bit that's, about us yeah it's cool I, I think that's a really big call out because we've actually seen this a lot where okr can draw out rumor has just dropped off and joined us again um okr can really raise and, and flat and draw out people who might not be fully engaged and might be having sort of issues mm. along the way and it's something where for you as leaders, you've got to be aware of this. When you're implementing something like OKR, it can draw out those sort of situations. So you've got to be ready for those type of issues to pop up mm. where people might not be so engaged on the, the company. They might not be quite so passionate or they just might not be that effective. Mm. And for, for a lot of CEOs we talk with, they're actually like, well, that's a good thing. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Um, but you've got to make sure that you're ready for it. Mm. Mm. Exactly. Um, yeah, definitely when you, when you, when you have leads of... Um, certain you know, key results and if you're meeting on a weekly basis um, and you, you, you have a look at the activities uh, relating to that um, OKR and you know um, yeah and obviously the, the score at the end um, definitely um, you can see and it's like a bit of it's good it produces a good um, especially if you've got certain leads on certain key results it produces a bit of a, a competition people don't want to let each other um, down so yeah so it's a quite a good um it's like a, a bit of a competition to make sure that um they're moving the 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 um the score a little bit every week so um yeah so we found that um just recently just um with, with a with a few little key results we have here um yeah that's definitely the teams involved in trying to make sure that they're not left behind and their key results so yeah it's good hundred percent hundred percent. And everyone, I want to invite you now to, to jump off off mute if you've got some questions. I've got one question here, um, which, uh, you know, it's probably not tied back to Jay exactly, but we can probably um, come back to that one in a moment. But yeah, what, what sort of questions do we have for Jay? So Jay has gone through this journey. He's quite well and truly into it now. And he's had to go through those sort of leadership challenges of introducing this type of framework, both from a change management perspective, but also... Yeah, where he ran into issues with people that weren't quite bought in or weren't quite performing at the level they needed to. 
uh, you know, any sort of questions for Jay and his experience with this? Again, for us here, I really want to bring a non-technology experience into this. Um, you know, obviously they do do a lot of tech, but they're not like a traditional tech company that, you would, that you'd see around. So I want to sort of get some of those insights and, and thoughts. So yeah, anyone got any sort of key questions for Jay? I have one. Um, it, it probably starts leading into the OKR process, right? Because you um, is the input your growth plans or your strategy? Like, how do you sort of link? Here's how we're going to grow, or here's what we're trying to achieve. Mm. Like defining the objectives. Do you yeah. Do that collectively? Yeah, it just depends on how you're structured. If you're like a public company, obviously, objectives is um, to, to shareholder, <laughs> to shareholders, etc. So it comes down with. Uh, I know it sounds a bit silly, but life purpose, I guess, what you want as a as a human, and then it sort of comes down from there. And, and to do that, yeah, you come down to. Um, you know, what the objective, my, my objective was to become like, you know, obviously one of the biggest engineering companies in Australia. So to do that, you can't just, um, you know, you have to obviously think a bit bigger. And so, but, you know, as an entrepreneur, you kind of, you know, um, you, you sort of, um, my biggest issue, a lot of entrepreneurs is, you know, you, you, the, the next sort of shiny object, you sort of uh, are going this way and going that way. And, and the great thing about Tim was he really focuses you on, okay, what's the higher objective of the company? Okay, you want to be the biggest engineering company in Australia? What what does that entail, you know? Um, and that means, okay, we need to offer more services. Um, we need to offer more locations. So, yeah, so it's literally, yeah, we need five offices, obviously, six offices. We need um, to provide more services um, and then yeah we, we, we slowly bite off um, what that is so for us it was first get the um, accreditations that will help us increase our revenue um, then it was about uh, making sure we had more locations so making sure that um, the key result was actually quite clever was actually um, um, it's not like open up five locations it was um, what's the percentage of jobs we can do in Perth locally so that was a key result. So in the respect, it wasn't the, um, okay, let's have the office open. It was actually um, in, to do a job in Perth so we don't have to send it to Melbourne or whatever. What's a percentage, you know, is it 90%? So that was a, the aim is to get 100% of the jobs done locally. So, um, yeah, then once that's... Um, there, then, yeah, it's, it's also coming back to um, things change also. That's why I think a two-month cadence for us is quite good because things change as well. Some opportunities might come up, like IIT has just jumped up at us in the last two or three months, and we see that's a really good way of connecting the whole business together. Um, yeah, but I think it's um, – and obviously, too, as a personally, I don't want to be – kind of oper working in the operation level of the business anymore when it will be working on a higher level of the business so one of the key results was for me to um um i have lessons you know i have uh, um 75 um 75 percent of jobs or more don't have my input in at all so yeah so that's one of my key results for me to um, do that but yeah it just depends on yeah, I guess what your goal and objective is. But our goal and objective is to become the biggest engineering company in Australia. So um, quite high. Um, it's a quite a high <laughs> goal. So we've got a type of um, keep growing. So, yeah, we've gone, you know, we've we've probably doubled the size in terms of head count. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's... Um, that's probably the best way to explain it. But if I, as again, if I had shareholders, it'd be different. We'd probably be hammering down on our current services and that, and no investment would be going back into some of the new services and that because we want to increase our profits. So, uh, but for us, it's a bit different. We're just a family owned company. So. Yeah. Cool story. Well, I, I like that. I think, you know, it's that, that, that beauty of being a purpose led business and having that optionality and freedom. Mm. Um, yeah. Any other questions and thoughts, Stephen? Yeah, can I just, yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, just you mentioned there you operate on that two-month cadence. Mm. You know, is that, was it just the change? You sort of just alluded to it there, it was? That yeah, month? so what it was, it started on a six-week cadence um, because some of the objectives, because um, one of the things too, I think um, you can, uh, as Tim said, you can have too many objectives as well. And we weren't big enough to have like an objective for the technical team, objective for the sales team, an objective for the um, operational team, um, marketing team. We, we were kind of, too, so we had to have one objective and kind of had to grow um, the, the objective 
objective had to be all about growth um, and then um, yeah, the key results would um, then complement the growth. We do have uh, at the moment, one of the things is to increase our sales pipeline um, to a certain amount, but then we do have some sub objectives as uh, key results, sorry, which then, so one of them is a product, one of them is a, is a service that then tie up to the, um, to the, to the main key result. Um, yeah, so we wanted to obviously didn't want to have a three month because we thought that was too long to try to knock this off. We wanted to try to really um, dig in and try to get those um, results quickly. Um, so we started off with six weeks and now we're kind of, with the new people on board, we find that two months is just perfect for us. Um, and um, yeah, we, we find that a, a two month period is great because we kind of look at um, this month and also um, the previous month. And yeah, we, we find two months is is perfect for us, especially because we only have one key, um, one objective for the for the two months. Um, yeah, I think three months would be too long because um, we kind of then take it longer to achieve our goals <laughs> and uh, a, a month would be or six weeks is a bit too soon because we don't we can't really make inroads into those key results so yeah two months for us is, is perfect at the moment yeah great thanks perfect any other questions for jay No, I think it, I think it's a really useful example. And what we we're just talking about before, we've got the sub key results. That, that is actually an OKR for the sales team. So they have a key result, and based off that key result, the sales team have basically set their own. And I think it actually changed too in conversation with the sales team because we realised that the metrics weren't quite right. And so this is part of the beauty of OKR as well: is that you come back, revisit, and iterate it based on feedback. You don't just set it and go right. That's it. We set it. We got feedback and said, okay, we need to change this. And so now there's that sort of point. Jay's at this really interesting time in his journey. So the company, as he said, he's doubled the headcount. So when we started, six weeks was a good cycle. Two months is now probably a good feel. And, you know, who knows how long that'll go for. The next thing that, that sort of Jay's running into, and this is, this is the tensions that you'll find in all your businesses as you're embedding OKR, is you'll hit certain thresholds where the scale starts to hurt. So when you're a brand new start startup or a relatively small business, one OKR for the company in, in the entire company is, is enough. And then at some point, you'll need to start having sub sort of to, or team-based OKRs just because, again, you know, there's not much point having an, an OKR for the sales team where it's, you know, per, one person or half a person's job, right? You know, if they're the receptionist and the salesperson, you're not really going to get that value out of it. But as you grow, you're going to hit these thresholds where you need it. And those are quite painful, those thresholds as you go through. So it's really important to think about how do you make this as a repeatable pattern and what is the right time to start having teams that set OKRs. So not all of Jay's teams set OKRs at the moment. Some are is still hooked into the business level one, but some of those teams are now starting to get to a point where they need their own OKR. So a bit of an art to it. And the other thing, just Tim, you were mentioning, you know, the structure isn't it, you know, like the importance of having the dependency of the teams that are sort of um, autonomous, isn't it? So so as you're growing it, that Jay, is it you're very conscious of that fact that as you're building the teams, you've got to make sure that you have those autonomous teams. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing, especially, you know, just a simple one that we have here. We wanted to have a certain amount open rate on our email marketing campaign. So it was a good one to introduce to like our, one of our new girls um, who's working on the marketing of the business. Um, it's kind of like a troll. So we've got a 21% open rate and we've got another one going out this week. So we sat down on Tuesday and we said, okay, how can we get like up to 30%? You know, we need to maybe add an offer in, we need to do this, do that. And it's, um, it's quite good a challenge in us and she's really wanting to move from 21% to, to 30% open rate on that email marketing campaign. So, um, so yeah, so that's, um, yeah, as I said, and it's a thing too, Tim will probably speak to you, I don't know, but about the operational rhythm of the company now. So we have a daily, um, we have a daily um, uh, team meeting, go through about 15 minutes. We also have a, a weekly OKR meeting. Uh, one thing also that I've um, found is as your team grows, you don't really want to reflect too much on the past in the OKR meetings. So what I do now is I send out a weekly um a weekly not newsletter a weekly summary of the business um of the sales um customer complaints all the all the health matrix i send out a weekly one on a friday so that gives a team opportunity to reflect on what's happened so we really want to make sure that on a monday when we have our okr meeting that it's really based on what we're going to do for the future not reflect too much on the past so um because everyone's time's limited and you've got like 10 people in the meeting 
um you know that's a lot of a lot of money that's going down the drain if you you, you just reflect on the past so yeah so we're kind of getting into the operational rhythm as well really trying to okay what's what's blocking us what do we need to do um you know what are we all working on this week to make sure we can move those key results so yeah that's probably the other thing that i've um learned especially with tim's input is the operating rhythm of the business now um everyone knows where they have to be at a certain time we even have a fortnightly meeting now for the email newsletter we we, we schedule that in um we have a technical meeting every week about um the issues about you know trying to get those key results down as well so yes yeah, so i work with the different teams to make sure we're moving those key results but yeah it's um it's really good and it's, it's, it takes a while to get into that at the start it's very sloppy um but it just takes a while to get into um and you have one thing that we did is we probably over put so many things on the agenda trying to achieve for the meeting now we just have a a few key points and you really got to empower your team to try to come back because the results that's the great thing about OKRs. i think um the guide intel said you know you either achieve them or you don't there's no it's kind of it's black and white there's no um there's no gray areas with um OKRs and that's the thing I think I really loved about it is it's yeah it's either you know you achieve it or you don't there's no um the gray and and you know whoever's accountable for that um it's pretty much highlighted um as you as you go on the um on the journey awesome I'm just conscious of time and we've got a question here from Alien is that how you pronounce your name I forgot that right oh, Helen are you there can you hear me? Yeah, hey, uh, it's a healing. A healing. Okay, cool. Nice one, mate. And uh, you had a question. Was yeah. It Go for it. Um, yeah, so uh, just interesting, just reflecting on what Jay was saying about um, not spending too much time in the past. It's something that I'm, cog- uh, I'm quite conscious of when we do sort of end of OKR reflections and then, set, you know, making time to set the new ones. Um, you, know, you mentioned the, you mentioned the sort of statement. You know, don't want to spend too much time. I guess what is too much time versus you know enough time? Because um, part of the thing of the mindset and culture I try to bring to the team is we set these goals. When we don't, when we hit them, awesome. But when we don't hit them, you know, what is the learnings we can take from that? And what are the action oriented outcomes that we can go? Okay, we needed. Um, you know, we, we didn't meet this goal because we didn't have the right level of engagement with another team or dependency organization. Um, so I, I do, I do recognize it's costly and I'm cognizant of that, but I also see the value in doing it. And I'm just, I'm looking for some guidance in terms of, you know, how, what's the best practices or what's worked for you guys. Oh, yeah, that's um, a good question. Um, when I say we don't spend time, I'm mainly just talking about the weekly meetings, just the weekly catch-ups um, that we don't spend a lot of time in the past. We're definitely at the end of the cadence um, when Tim comes in for the next um, key objective. We do spend a, a fair bit of time on on the past, definitely, um, on especially the ones that you haven't met um, and what could have been done better. So, yeah, we do definitely. But, yeah, in terms of the weekly meetings, just in terms of... Um, in terms of you know looking at the health matrix and how the business is traveling etc we don't spend too much time on the um on the profit loss and the sales because that's sort of it's already happened so we try to work out um yeah what one thing that i have done with the the weekly meeting is we've got like a, a red a green and a yellow thing now in the health matrix so anything in green where it's okay anything in yellow or red we pretty much get onto that and say okay why are sales down why is this not working why is the turnaround of our jobs this why are we getting so many reactive calls from customers um that that's yeah so they're the things that we we discuss but yeah i agree um at the end of the cadence and when tim comes in and helps us um set our next key objective we um we do spend a a fair bit of time especially the ones that we haven't met definitely awesome thanks jay Perfect. And look, I think, you know, just, just for those that are probably familiar with the format, we do re- different types of retrospectives. One of the common ones, and it's probably a little bit lazy of me, but it's the sailboat retro. It's something where, you know, you're looking back at the past, lessons learned and those kind of things, and then taking it forward. You just got to make sure you're having a deeper conversation because that sort of thing you are doing. Well, you know, for Jay, it's every every two months, but for some of you, it might be quarterly. Um, but having a deeper chat about, okay, you know, how did things go? How did we learn from that? And also looking at your score. So how did you actually score and go on each of your OKRs? And, you know, why did you overachieve? Why did you underachieve? So really 
really important sort of stuff. Gang, I'm really conscious of time. What, what, one more, which um, Ali and I, I'm, I'm, I've probably mispronounced that name, but anyway, I've, I'll have a crack at getting it right. Um, so one more that you had was really around products where you're not releasing for about 12 months. So we do see a bit of that where you've got uh, environments. In fact, green tech, this is a really common thing because you've got to build a certain level of infrastructure. There's loads of different ways of doing it and it's very context dependent. But one of the key ways that we use is think about what does that success look like for the customer and things that are measurable so that you can then tie that back to uh, things that you can test with them and, and talk to them about. So as an example, you know, maybe we want to know that we can get through a certain process within an amount of time. That might be something you're building and we want people to be able to complete a certain task within a certain amount of time. You can then simulate that by trying it out with you know, customers using uh, you know, some sort of interactive wireframe or something like that. And the software team can work towards that to actually build that, you know, can, we, can someone work through that process so quickly? So, you know, ideally you want to be able to release stuff sooner and get stuff out sooner and get feedback on it. And I'll always challenge people to see how they can do that. But as a general rule of thumb, you know, if it can be very hard to get to that point and that's fine if that's your sort of environment. It's thinking about what numbers can you measure both internally from an experience perspective, but also test in the real world. The key part being testing in the real world, even if it's not testing with the real product, tying in some sort of product discovery thing there to, to test things out. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so I guess the constraints we have is we're in a medical device um, world, so there's a lot of regulation. So having the product from an engineering perspective is obviously relatively quick, but it's going through that validation process with um, regulatory bodies takes time. So we don't have that infrastructure in the real world to, or in the market to actually measure, you know, uplift to customer adoption and you know sales, etc. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Sorry, oh, I was just saying some of your tips were, yeah, they're quite good. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, look, and I think we could go, go on this for hours. You know, there will be numbers that you can use. It might be about prospects and things like that. That's at the enterprise level. For the team level and product level, yeah, it's um, that's a little bit trickier. But again, just looking for those sort of numbers, anything you can use that look at, looks at what is the success behind it. Design thinking, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that has a whole bunch of really cool practices and ideas that you can actually apply to test products out. But everyone, this brings us to the end of the session. One big ask, please, 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 can you fill out the survey for me? Really, really, really would appreciate your feedback. We've covered a lot of ground today. So thanks for hanging out for the for the full time. I'm curious to hear, was that long enough, too long, um, you know, not long enough, whatever it might be. Give us that feedback. That'd be really, really awesome. We're going to leave the poll going for a little bit. Jay, special massive thanks to you, mate. I know you're absolutely no slammed. So part of the whole OKR thing is it's been a double-edged sword for you guys. I know you're pretty busy now because of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's yeah, right. Exactly. For... No, it's awesome. That's great. Um, yeah, I, as I said, all of, all I can do is um, read OKR praises. So, yeah, it's definitely, especially if you're an all-over-the-place entrepreneur like I was, it's a fantastic. And, um, yeah, Tim's um, yeah, Tim's helped us um, no end. So, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it's it's a, it's, it's a great system, and yeah, Tim runs a very um, good um, program. So yeah, recommend it. Awesome. Cheers, cheers for the praise, mate. Thank you so much. But no, all right, awesome, everyone. Thank you so much for for making the time. Over the next next day or two, I'm going to send out all this material. Um, you know, please do check it out. We do have the free online learning as well as the paid course. So if you don't want to pay, there's some good free stuff there. To get you started. Uh, you know, anyway, if you've got any questions, please do hit me up. I want to keep this conversation going. So anytime you've got any questions, anything like that, just flicking through. Thank you so much and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. All right. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. See you, guys. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Blake. Thanks, Jay.